Hello. Hello. Yeah, my Hobbit uh, ringtone just going off. One second. There you go. <laughs> yes. How are you doing? But I'm good. How are you? I can't see you. Am I oh. able to? Yes, you are. You want to see my ugly mug? We're joined today by Robert Halfon, Conservative MP for Harlow and Chair of the Education Select Committee. Robert has been a vocal advocate for getting schools open and keeping them open throughout the pandemic. He's called for schools to be classed as essential infrastructure, only closing in the most exceptional of circumstances, and has likened the impact of school closures to the four horsemen of the educational apocalypse. Welcome, Robert. Thank you for joining us on Sketch Notes. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Um, so, yeah, you campaigned tirelessly, really, throughout the last two years about the impact of school closures on pupils. Can you just tell us a little bit about when you first became concerned? Well, I was concerned from day one when the government announced the that they were going to close the uh, schools predominantly for most pupils um, because I felt that it was going to uh, damage pupils' uh, educational attainment, their mental health, their well-being. And I just have always had a strong feeling that children need to be in school. Um, I, I, in my early life, because I was born with a walking disability, spent a lot of time out of school having operations and recovering at home or in hospital. I missed a fair whack of, of schooling. I just know what it's like not to be in school. I know what effect it has on you. It isn't just about the education, of course, because you're not making friends, you're not socialising. There are often families uh, uh, who are disadvantaged for one reason or another. They rely on the school to get a good meal. They rely on the school for friendship. They rely on the school for the support that the teachers and other staff bring them and the counsellors uh, for their mental health. And all that was stopped. Um, and the government said, well, vulnerable children can go to school. But in the first lockdown, I think um, over 90 percent of vulnerable children didn't go didn't go to school so it was a big mistake and other countries in Europe didn't close the schools and I hope we never go down that path again. And I mean I think on on that you have tabled the private members bill which would see schools classed as essential infrastructure I guess for the reasons you you've just mentioned they go well beyond education really. Can you tell us a little bit more about about that bill and, and what it would do if passed? Yeah. Though that bill is a very important bill, and I'm grateful for the support of uh, the parents group, us for them, which you represent, uh, Molly, and also uh, the legal advice uh, on that bill. What that bill says is that just as uh, the NHS and food shops, supermarkets are essential infrastructure, uh, schools should be re uh, regarded as essential infrastructure as as well, and they should be treated no differently. And what does that mean in practice? That God forbid we're ever in this situation again, and the government decides they want to have a lockdown, that um, before that happens, the Children's Commissioner would have a right of veto. The second uh, veto would be there would have to be a specific vote in Parliament on school closures, school and college closures. And the third part of that, that's a triple lock, if you like, would be that Parliament would return every three weeks to, to vote on whether the school should be continue to be closed. And I hope we're never down this path again, but uh, given what's happened with variants and God knows what, the unpredictably unpredictable nature of this, that uh, uh, if the government decide on lockdown, they have to separate that a lockdown from a school's closing. And is it your view that schools should have stayed open throughout? Because obviously there's a bit of a revisionist movement, let's say, about this at the moment. And I think that the damage um, from school closures is being more widely acknowledged. But I guess we have to remember these decisions took place in the context of the time. But, you know, it, what what is obvious now or perhaps at the time of the second school closures might not have been in in March 2020 but is it in your view should schools have have never closed? Well I accept there are some people and we were all scared in the first lockdown because none of us knew what this disease was you didn't have testing you didn't have vaccines um, and you saw these pictures of from Italy I mean everybody remembers those awful pictures so I can understand why the decision was made but nevertheless I thought it was the wrong 
one. I always said I wasn't at the beginning a lockdown skeptic. I'm much more of a skeptic now, but I wasn't a lockdown skeptic. I was always a school down skeptic because I looked at other countries in Europe um, who were keeping their schools open, France particularly, uh, other countries around the world um, who were keeping their schools open because they realised the damage that it was doing to children. What I felt that the government wasn't doing and the esta educational establishment was understandably worried about the risk of COVID, but what they weren't weighing up other risks to, to children. And that's why from very early on, I felt that I had to speak out and campaign against schools uh, closing. And as the months went on, and the statistics started coming out. One, we found out that um, even though they were open for vulnerable children, they weren't going, um, that these children were not learning at home. They didn't have digital devices. So we had a kind of digital divide between the haves and the have nots. And the further uh, statistics came out about safeguarding hazards affecting children and lifetime chances. And it got worse and worse. And I found it quite extraordinary that after the uh, late in 2020, uh, Christmas 2020, when Christmas got banned by the government, um, that they still decided to close the schools. And I thought that was a, there was no excuse for that. And there was, that was a big mistake. Uh, and I fought very hard in Parliament to, to try and stop that. I reiterate when we say school closures, it should be school closures for the majority of pupils, not the children of key workers and vulnerable children, having said that. And yeah, I mean, I think there were more vulnerable children attending during that second phase of school closures, but I think it still hovered below about 50%, which, you know, shows shows your concerns were were valid, well, I guess. What, what was wrong was that this decision went ahead, even though the statistics by then had come out from the Centre for Social Justice, from the Sutton Trust, from uh, um, uh, the Education Policy Institute, you name it, from almost every organisation uh, that does data that was showing the, the enormous damage on children and uh, that school closures were bringing, yet they still made the decision to close the schools. And did you make representations at that time as, you know, obviously through your role in, uh, on the Education Select Committee or uh, just separate? I made representations through the media. Mm. I wrote articles about it. I uh, spoke on broadcast media throughout the year. I raised it in Parliament at every opportunity in the chamber when there were education debates. Um, I raised it in the select committee um, with ministers uh, when when they came, and uh, because I just thought this this was such a disastrous uh, decision, and we will be paying for it. The children will be paying for it. Sadly, I think for many months and years to come. Well, I mean, and I think you know, sadly, I I think you're right, and I think. Um, this last week actually was um, International Education Day, and I don't know if you saw what what UNICEF said said about the worldwide school closures, but they they said quite simply we're looking at a nearly insurmountable scale of loss to children schooling. Now, without wishing to catastrophize or to write off, you know, the the life chances of a generation. How how do you think that's a statement that applies to children in the UK? You know how how hopeful are you that they can recover from this? Well, I think to adapt an old phrase that the former president of Israel made about the Jewish people, she said, pessimism is a luxury that no Jewish parent can allow himself. I'm from a Jewish background, I think pessimism is a luxury that no parent or, or no adult really should allow themselves about a children. I do think that despite what has got on, children have resilience and uh, if the if the right policies are followed, a proper catch up that works that makes sure that the most disadvantaged children are reached, that proper funds are invested in it, that there aren't geographical disparities with that um, catch up activity, and then we can do something about this. And there needs to be a huge amount of work on mental health. Um, again, we have to be careful about stigmatising children, but I do believe long after COVID has gone, we potentially face a mental health epidemic uh, because so many people have been affected, young people have been affected. I know that from my own constituents in Harlow, and I've heard stories from many parents about how it's affected their, their children. So a lot of mental health resilience work needs to, to go on uh, alongside that. And my worry is that whilst the government are doing some good things, um, things are 
a lot is falling by the wayside and we're not getting it right in the way in the way that we should so there needs to be a national effort uh, a national recovery program um, for our young people chil pupils children pupils students uh, to get them back on track and make sure that we repair the damage of the last couple of years. And and can you, a few points I think there to, to pick up on, but I think on, on maybe let's start with recovery and then talk specifically about mental health, because health, I know you've got yeah. a debate coming up this week um, on that, but on, on recovery, um, what is your, well, I guess, first of all, what is your assessment of what a good um, an adequate recovery plan would look like because obviously back in I think it was February um, last year uh, Sir Kevin Collins was appointed as a recovery SAR and you know as we now know that that didn't work out too well he he I believe thought that the catch-up the scale of the catch-up program was something in the region of 14 billion pounds and was offered a fraction of that I guess in light of that and what has happened since, you know, where where are we on recovery? What what does it look like now as compared to what it needs to look like? Well, look, I think the government are doing some good things and it's important to that. I think Nadim Zahari, I respect him hugely. I think he's got a grip uh, on the department, which we haven't seen um, uh, for some time. And I think that's welcome. They have, they have got five billion pounds for the catch up. The issue I have is that it's not reach uh, currently it's not reaching the most disadvantaged students remember these are the students who learned the least during lockdown who weren't in school who probably didn't have digital computers at home and the other thing is there are regional disparities so in the south west for example there's nearly 100 percent take up in the northeast it's much 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 lower so i'd like to see a program of catch up i'd like to see the government being imaginative and have look at longer school days and i don't mean that a, a young person should be learning algebra till nine o'clock at night. What I'm talking about is bringing civil society organisations in to work with the school so that uh, the students can't, don't just do academic catch up, but particularly focus on music, arts, creative activities, uh, drama, uh, sports, because all the statistics show that if you have, if you increase those activities for children and have a longer school day, you increase their educational attainment as as well and don't forget over the lockdown um, you know millions of pupils were denied all these uh, activities so it wasn't just a question of whether or not they were doing remote academic learning but they weren't able to do art drama and, and sports which are so essential to uh, young people's well-being and growing up uh, uh, as well no i mean and i i personally as a parent i feel that the um you know, the talk of the longer school days has been a bit misrepresented. And actually, you know, this this sounds like, you know, music to my ears, and I'm sure music to many parents is because actually children have missed so much. And um, you've spoken, I guess, and just sticking on recovery and, and, you know, what we need to do to make good the damage and looking forward. You've spoken before about the need for education to be put on a secure 10 year funding plan to you know rival that of of other departments could you tell us a little bit more about your kind of vision for the long term yeah so what i've never understood is the national health service has a 10-year plan and has been given a big whack of money 20 billion extra under Theresa may another 35 billion although we're going to be paying it through our national insurance um which is a separate issue that we can perhaps discuss but um that's going to be an extra 36 billion over three years the Defence Department got an extra 16 billion in strategic review. So, and we're told that we have to protect the NHS all the time, which is fine. I believe in the NHS, but why on earth aren't we told we have to protect our children's education? Where are the adverts for that? Where is the proposal for uh, a, a huge funding increase for education? Now, Nadim, to be fair, has got some money out of the Treasury and stabilised it, but it's still very much going cap in hand, begging uh, for extra funding. Uh, even though he's managed to achieve a fair bit in a short time personally as secretary of state so all i'm asking for is if other departments can have long-term plans what's more important than education i mean what is leveling up about if it isn't about education if it isn't about bringing people to the ladder of opportunity helping them um, climb up um what's the point if we don't um make education an essential part going back to the infrastructure bill an essential part of our national infrastructure and 
because it's about the future of our country. If you get on that ladder, if you get the education you need, you get the skills, you then get job security, prosperity for yourself and your family. It's good for you. It's good for the country because we build up the skills that we need in our country as well. And yet, for some reason, it is not part of the triangle of the economy and health. And that needs to change. It should be uh, the, you know, the top priority for the government. And I know everybody's going on about Partygate, but I would, which has been not great, of course, and very sad. But I'd like to see um, the Prime Minister win back the trust of the population by setting out a long term plan for, for education and telling every family in the country what his, what his vision is. I think that's what people care about at the end of the day and make a huge difference. You know, obviously you make a very interesting point here, which is the divergence in spending between health and education. Why is it that we spend so much more on healthcare than education in this country? And I think that gap has been consistently widening, actually, since the early 2000s. It was much, much closer um, at the turn of the millennium. I genuinely don't. I wish I knew the answer. I don't know the answer to it of course we have an aging population we need to spend money on the nhs there's an umbilical cord between the british people and the nhs no doubt about it in my mind i believe in the nhs i've been lucky uh, to be looked after by great ormond street as a child but i don't understand why we don't put the same emphasis on on the nhs and i don't understand why every day during the lockdown you had wash your hands protect the nhs saves lives but there should have been an advert protect our children's education and that has got to change. And there is a movement in this country from all kinds of different groups, whether it's uh, us for them, whether it is um, policy groups, whether it's people like me who are campaigning for a long term plan for education and a vision uh, for it. And um, I think um, things are changing to, again, credit the government, because it's important not just to moan all the time. And, and the government are getting some things right, like they've, they've introduced in terms of skills, a thing called a lifetime skills guarantee, which will mean that every person who hasn't got a level three in a core subject will be able to do that free of charge. And that will get them on the ladder. And they're spending billions on that, billions of pounds. And that's really welcome. I'd like them to talk about it more. I'd like to, them to offer every young person an apprenticeship. That's my dream. I've employed six apprentices in my office, never been done before genuine apprentices in my office. Um, but so they're getting some of things right. But why let's have that long term plan on education in the round rather than just having a series of closed pegs without a washing line, a series of random announcements like next Monday, there might be we're giving 20 million for music. And that another thing, are we going to spend 100 million on literacy or we're getting 3 million on sports activities? All good. But there's no narrative behind it. What's the vision for education? What's the strategy? How are we going to make it happen? What's the long term plan? Uh, so let's fit these clothes pegs all on the washing line, have that proper narrative and and plan that is needed for our children. I mean, you know, I think you're right. I think that is something a lot of stakeholders from all sides, um, you know, of the political spectrum would love to get behind. I guess, you know, the question is, how does that happen? How how do you incentivize government to to adopt that kind of that vision and and level of commitment well something that you all know very very well at the us for them is one thing that is written i think if you uh, carved you know cut your cut your hands god forbid it would come out we are campaigners and and that's how you achieve things because you have to relentlessly campaign for things I liken these things to a pizza delivery leaflet. Um, you get a thousand pizza delivery leaflets through your letterbox, you usually just throw them all in the bin. One day you come at home and you've seen that pizza leaflet for about the 2000th time from Domino's or whatever it is. And you suddenly pick it up and order a pizza because you've got no pizza and then you're hooked. And so you just, there's endless repetition and politics is like, if you want to get a message across, you have to send that pizza delivery leaflet you know, a million times before it gets noticed. But but I do, I'm an optimist. I do believe that more and more people are talking about this in the way, uh, not, you know, I've been chairman of the education committee since 2017. I think people talk about education in a way they haven't talked about in a long time because of what's happened during lockdown. And I think there is a coalition coming together, very dis different and disparate groups of people who want a long-term plan for education and want the 
the government to to to, to really make this top of their agenda. Um, so you've got a debate coming up later this week, um, I believe, about children's mental health and wellbeing. Could you just tell us a little bit more about that and what you're hoping to achieve by that? Yes. So, um, in the House of Commons, a, a, an MP can go and bid for a debate. So it's a bit like Dragon's Den. You have to go to a committee and literally bid and make the case why the, the, the committee, the backbench committee should give you time for this debate. And I bid some weeks ago. Um, I was supposed to have it in January, but um, I just, COVID got me for a couple of weeks. And it was rearranged for this Thursday. It isn't just about mental health. It's also about the catch-up programme, uh, to look at where it's not working. So I'm going to discuss three things on Thursday. The first is I want to talk about the ghost children, what I've called the ghost children from since last summer. These are 100,000 plus children who've not returned to school for the most part since schools were fully reopened. There are over, there were close to 800 classrooms where whole classes have vanished. I mean, it's unthinkable, but this is what has happened. There is a series, a grim series on TV called The Departed, um, which um, where uh, like a member of each family vanishes. So it's a bit like that awful it, it's a great tv series but very sad that tv series come uh, has come to light um and this is you've got loads thousands of children in exam years you've got um it's a surprise surprise it's in the most disadvantaged areas where most children have gone missing and yet the effort from the government to get these children back to school has been piecemeal so what um, what needs to happen to find them and and well what um the center for social justice have suggested which have done this report and done this important work and they are an incredibly important think tank in britain today i'd say one of the most important on social justice issues and education and they've suggested that the government use those underspending the catch-up fund to employ 2,000 attendance advisors across the country that literally work with families to get these children back to school make it advisory. The amazing thing is the DfE doesn't even have the proper data on these children and how, how many they are, where they are. And I always find that astonishing. We don't even know how many children are being home educated. Now, there's an argument for whether well, home educated is good or bad, but we should at least have the proper figures and the DfE don't collect that data. If I was if I was the Secretary of State, I'd have a big military map on my wall in my office uh, with every school in the country that was missing these pupils and like a flash or a computer red lights flashing up where the biggest problems were and then directing resources to those areas to get those kids back to school is there an urgency question with it as well so the longer they're there well, it's going up so it was a hundred thousand it's over a hundred thousand now and what could be more urgent than returning children to school who have not now been there for nearly three years so two years two years and a half if they haven't gone back when when did schools fully open again last year was it um march the 8th march the 8th yeah march last year so <clears throat> these kids have not even been back to school and very very worrying the second part of the debate which is what we've been talking about earlier is whether the catch-up fund is reaching the most disadvantage the government hired a big corporate company called randstad to to run it run the program um they've only reached 15 percent of students so far and the third part of it is going to be about mental health and well-being and looking at some of the problems that we've highlighted already in some of your questions and looking at some of the things that great schools i went to see newham sixth form collegiate college in a deprived part of london incredible school incredible head teacher they don't like using the word mental health they talk about mental health resilience mm. and they bring sports stars to meet the kids to talk to them about mental health resilience they give uh, children practice sessions in exam rooms so they get used to that awful exam as someone who hated exams by the way that's supposed to be confidential but it won't be anymore but when i was growing up i hated exams but to make um so that they're less anxious when they have to go and do do examinations so they're they're, they're leading that school is leading i've got a committee session i've we've got gus o'donnell the former permanent secretary for gordon brown and the prime minister uh, david cameron coming to our committee to talk about this in a couple of weeks because he's doing a lot of work on it and lord layard very famous distinguished peer uh, as well but we have what i'd like to see is the government look at mental health resilience programs but also to in my view they have to put mental health counselors in every school um, to work with the kids and the pupils 
And because that, that has been mentioned um, at various points over the last six months, a year, hasn't it? Is that, is that any closer to happening? The government say there's going to be 25 percent, I think, by 2023 or 2025 and 25 percent of schools. But that was before lockdown. So that to me, they need to rocket boost it. And also there is a way they can raise money. I think look, I'm very I love technology. I love the Internet and social media has uh, a lot of good things, but it also has a lot of bad as well. And what uh, I have suggested is that there would be a two percent windfall tax on social media companies who are raking it in, I mean, making billions of pounds, are causing enormous damage, companies like TikTok causing enormous damage to people's mental health. And what um, we should have is a mental health levy, in essence, mm -hmm. raise 100 million pounds and use that to promote mental health resilience programmes across our schools. That's just with a 2% levy. And I guess, I mean, one of the issues here is that, you know, as you've said, it tends to be certain categories of children um those already you know less advantaged who are hit hardest by many of the pandemic measures and i guess you know the other issue which i know you've been very vocal on recently is the cost of living crisis how concerned are you that you know the cost of living um, issues are going to hit the same group of of students and young people well it's massive because if you're uh, paying energy bills um they're potentially going up for the average family 2,000 quid a year. Now, who on earth can afford 2,000 quid a year on your energy bills? Food inflation has gone up by 10%. You know, a loaf of bread in Asda might have been 50, 60 p. It's now £1.06. Um, so we've got inflation going up across the board. You know, every single envelope, when you you know when you get the post, it's just an envelope, another envelope with another bill, and that bill is bigger doesn't matter whether it's your sky tv your mobile phone your council tax the, um, when you go and fill up at the pumps everybody needs a car most people if you especially if you don't live near a tube station or in a metropolitan area that's costing you close to one pound fifty a liter i mean this is obscene a uh, price price hikes that are unaffordable for most families and these are all necessities everybody needs food everyone needs to travel everyone needs energy um so these are not luxuries and so um, this has to be a number one priority for the government to deal with. And I've suggested, again, a windfall tax on any, on oil companies, again, milking it, milking it at the moment, like, you know, raking in the money, billions of pounds, 20 billion pound profit. Why not use some of that money to cut bills, uh, to cut energy bills? We have on our energy bill these things called energy levers, green levers. They are supposed to be used to fund renewable energy. Well, that's all well and good, but they're 25% of our electricity bill. So if they got rid of that, they could reduce a few hundred or at least had a green levy escalator whereby if the energy price goes high, which is record high at the moment, the international energy price, the green levies would go down. So our bills would go down. And uh, I'd like to see the government cut VAT. We've just saved £4 billion by cutting overseas aid. Again, there's a separate argument whether or not that was a good thing to do or not doesn't matter they've done it and uh four billion pounds they could use to put that in a special fund to cut taxes and bills for the lower for the lower paid so with a bit of imagination um the government could do quite a uh, to do a fair bit i mean we've um going back to the sort of pandemic impacts and schools moving away from schools we've you know heard a lot about the impact of the pandemic on school children in particular and it, it has struck us actually for some time that the impact is in some ways you know well it's just as great on university students on those doing apprenticeships um how yeah you know, what have you seen um of, well, of i feel for university students because they're not a lot of them are not getting proper face-to-face -face teaching even you know adults can go back into an office and do whatever in fact they're actively being encouraged people have been encouraged now not to work from home anymore and yet some universities who are quite happy to hold business conferences and rake it in again, um, yet are not prepared to, um, to give full online face-to-face -face teaching. And again, I've campaigned on this, but I welcome the government have said recently that students should be able to make the complaint with the office for students and get their money back. But students had a very hard time. You saw them in lockdown, being locked in their halls of residences. And to go to the university was one of the greatest times of my life should be one of the best times of your life um and 
uh, for these students to be denied that incredible opportunity to enjoy uh, everything that getting a higher education can give you is pretty, pretty grim. Apprentices also suffered because their courses were cancelled, their training was cancelled. Uh, they were often let go by companies who couldn't afford to keep them on during lockdown. Uh, fortunately, the numbers of apprentices are bouncing back, but nevertheless, it's just another example of how so many young people struggled and suffered, perhaps unnecessarily, uh, during the lockdown because of these decisions. And I, I mean, I think now we're thankfully in a position where government, as you said, have recognised the need for education, you know, at all age groups to be restored. But they, you know, inadvertently, um, I'm sure, but, you know, we, we've got a situation where lots of councils and schools and universities are doing their own thing. Um, so it's a very uneven pattern. I think it's fair to say across the country. Um, what happens now from here? Because you know, you you and and government recognise the need. I think to to restore proper, hundred <laughs> percent normality for these pupils and students. And how 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 does that happen? One, with this, we've got to uh, keep the schools open. Whatever happens, uh, we've got to stop all this uh, forcing kids to wear masks. Even though the government have said they don't need it anymore, they shouldn't have been put there. This month, but even though they've taken the kind of too many schools are still doing it, the government has got to say that this is not acceptable. You know, the National Children's Deaf Society, the Children's Commissioner, Jonathan Van Tam, many others have warned about the damaging effect on masks. So the schools, uh, education establishments have got to stop gold plating coronavirus uh, health measures long after that they've disappeared for everyone else. And and that is and the, that will only come from firm leadership. You can blame the NEU or the unions or whatever it may be, I don't blame them. They will do what they they will do. At the end of the day, this comes down to leadership. So it's the uh, government, you think it's government that has to take control of that and give a clear directive? Absolutely. Absolutely. And when there are schools that are gold plating uh, masks or whatever it may be, or universities that are not doing online teaching, if I was a minister, I'd be ringing up those institutions directly and saying, what's going on? Why are you doing this? It will stop that's the way to stop these things they can't force them because a lot of these all organizations are autonomous and i'm quite into autonomy and devolution but nevertheless a call from the secretary of state why are you gold plating um that will soon make it make a make a difference it's got to be leadership and it's got to come from the prime minister downwards because um, when the prime minister says anything whoever he is whether it's uh boris or whoever um the whole of whitehall follows so i mean obviously you hear you know from a, a lot of your constituents I'm assuming have heard a lot from a lot of them over the last um, couple of years a lot of them parents and obviously it's your role through the education select committee you visit um, a lot of schools what do parents and teachers say about you know how pupils are now well, people say that the pupils have suffered and, and struggled I still believe that we've got to be optimistic I go back let's not allow ourselves to to be pessimistic because with the right policies we can change this but there's going to be an enormous amount of remedial work to do and a passion and a commitment and a belief that education has to be first and foremost in policy making and uh, that our job is to protect children's futures and and i think with the right policies we can repair this but only if there is the will to do it so you've talked a lot about the four horsemen of the educational apocalypse. Could you just explain um, what they are? I, I, when I first started talking about the four horsemen of the ap apocalypse, I was laughed at. Um, but the reality is, what, what are those four horsemen? The first is educational attainment. We know that pupils are months behind in their reading and their uh, numeracy, um, way behind. Every statistic under the sun shows that. But then you have the second horseman, which is mental health. You know, eating disorders amongst young girls went up by 400% during lockdown, 400%. Um, even uh, mental health referrals amongst young people have gone up to, uh, by, sorry, gone up by 60% amongst young people. When I was growing up, I didn't even know what the word mental health was. Um, when I go around schools, every single child talks to me about mental health. That's the second horseman. The third horseman of the uh, apocalypse is safeguarding. Look at what happened with baby Arthur. If he'd been at school, they might have found out what was going on. And we had this awful tragedy. You know, we don't know where these kids are. They're joining county line gangs. They're facing online harms. They are struggling 
from potentially from domestic abuse at home. Um, so we've left thousands of these children uh, to safeguarding houses. And the fourth one is a loss of life chances. The Institute of Fiscal Studies, I mean, this is mega respected financial economic institution, respected by all sides of the political debate, has said that students could lose up to 40% of their lifetime earnings because of lockdown. And they don't come with figures from, from thin air. Uh, they don't say these things because they're very, very credible. So all this damage we've done to to children and so that is what why education must be such a such a priority dealing with those four horsemen in in turn one by one just to make sure that we get those children back climbing that ladder of opportunity again is there a another concern here as well that actually there are future consequences of this so i think that you know there have been some very powerful papers done on the link between um time out of school and loss of health implications um, in later life. And wasn't there a study in America that showed the cost of American school closures had it just, I'll get the figure wrong, but, you know, millions of years off this cohort of children's lives. And it's very, very stark when you think about it. Well, everything I've learned about um, education is that um, the earlier you intervene, the better education that they can have you avoid problems later on. So, um, if you take, for example, 60% of prisoners have been excluded from school, 60%. Excluded pupils only get a grade, uh, and we have 40 children excluded every day from our schools, by the way, every school day, right? Um, and, and only 5% of them gets grades A to C, maths and English. Children in care, we had a committee session today, we had children in care only 7% of them get grades to A, C, A to C in maths and English, get decent GCSEs. And we allow all this to go on. And all we are doing is damaging the, um, what, who knows what they've become, what will happen to our society. And these are very deep questions, but uh, this is why um, education is so important because it isn't, people just think it's about a young life. It is about young life, but it's about uh, not just their futures, but actually the future well-being of our economy and our society as well. Well, exactly. And are you, you know, are there any attempts to quantify the that level of loss? I guess. I hope so. I mean, we we ask these questions as a committee, but these are very difficult questions to quantify. But it's the it, the 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 cost, the long-term cost of all this. Um, needs to be seriously looked at by the Department for Education and the Treasury, mm. without a doubt. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.